This is Stanford Engineering's The Future of Everything, and I'm your host, Russ Altman. Today, Professor Barbara Van Schievik will tell us about net neutrality, what it is and why we should care about it. She'll tell us that it's critical to guarantee innovation on the internet and to protect consumers as they use the internet increasingly. It's the future of net neutrality. You know, access to the internet has basically become a utility like water and electricity. But because of the way that the internet is built, there are opportunities for manipulation and basically for profiteering from use of the internet. Net neutrality refers to a set of policies where you prohibit internet service providers from looking at the packages that are being delivered to your device and charging you different amounts, more for one service than for another, more for movies than for sound. This is problematic because it limits innovation, it can entrench existing powerful companies, and it leads to a limited consumer experience at higher costs. Barbara Van Schievik is a professor of law at Stanford University and an expert on net neutrality. She's observed how it's gone down in Europe, in the U.S., and in other countries, and she sees worrisome things when there isn't a set of guarantees about net neutrality. This is concerning because in 2017, federal rules about net neutrality were significantly removed. Some states made laws to try to protect their citizens, but currently things are changing. Barbara, uh, let's start by defining net neutrality and why this is something that people should be thinking about probably more than they are. Net neutrality at its heart is a really simple principle. It's about this idea that we, the people who use the internet, get to decide what we do online. We get to decide what sites we want to visit, what apps to use, what videos to watch. And the companies that we pay to get online, you know, Comcast, AT&T, Verizon, T-Mobile, they don't get to interfere with our choices. And so that means that when the internet is governed by net neutrality, then Comcast or AT&T does not get to block websites that we want to visit, or they don't get to slow down certain services and speed up others, making them more attractive. And that's really important because if I can't use the app that I want to use, that sucks for me, and the app or the website can't compete. And um, then the final piece that's a core piece of net neutrality is that Comcast or AT&T, they can't charge companies that want to get to us for access to us or for a fast lane to us. And that has been really, really critical because it means that everybody has a chance to speak and be heard online, no matter the color of their skin or the size of their wallet. And, you know, college students with a little bit of savings get to invent the next Facebook and the next Google and the next Twitter. Um, and that has been really important over the course of the Internet. OK, so that thank you so much. And there is so much there to unpack uh, uh, because I did not even realize. Let's just go right to the most uh, the most concerning thing that you. Well, there's many concerning things, but I didn't even realize that my choice about where to go on the Internet is in any way hindered. So could you could you just tell me, am I, in fact, without realizing it, uh, getting uh, manipulated in terms of the sites that I visit and where I go? I thought I had complete freedom in using the internet, but maybe there's less freedom than I realized. Yeah, so you're in good company because that's the internet that we know and love. And the reason that's what we know is because in the US, basically net neutrality has governed the internet since its inception until 2017. And so we are totally used to being able to go where we wanna go and nobody interfering with our choices. But that's not a given. Um, the architecture of the internet, the technology since about the mid 1990s gives um, the internet service providers, the companies that connect us to the internet, the power to see exactly what we are doing online and then take action based on that. And so, as you might know, data travels over the internet in packets. And since the mid 1990s, internet service providers have the ability to look into these data packets and then take actions based on that. And so something that has been really popular originally when this technology came up, when online telephony came up and, you know, 
phone and cable companies were losing a lot of income because instead of placing expensive long distance calls or international calls, people started doing those online using things like Skype. And that was a huge loss in revenue. And so many internet service providers, both in the US and around the world, started blocking online telephony applications. And so there was a clear competitive reason for that. So in the US, the FCC right away said, this is not compatible with how we think the internet should work. You know, we think users should be able to choose what they want to do online. And interestingly, those were Republican chairman of the FCC. So, you know, net neutrality has never been a partisan issue. Republican chairman of the FCC, Federal Communications Commission, the agency that governs all of our communications network. So they have acted to protect these principles. And so in the US, then, you know, the first chairman of the Bush administration prohibited online telephony, prohibited normal internet service providers from blocking or slowing down online telephony. And so that hasn't happened here. By contrast, Europe didn't have um, net neutrality protections until 2015. And so they saw widespread blocking and discrimination. And so, for example, my husband's grandmother couldn't call us on Skype because her mobile phone providers was blocking online telephony on her mobile plan. Wow. Okay. So we, we've been a little bit lucky that at least up until for now, we've had substantial uh, freedom. Okay. So what is the argument uh, against net neutrality? I mean, first of all, it's a very nice phrase and it sounds almost like motherhood, like who wouldn't want net neutrality? But I'm sure there are people who are maybe even reasonable people who make arguments that this is not the right way to go. Can you encapsulate their argument? What's their best argument for not having these freedoms? Yeah, I want to start by saying that the people that make these kinds of arguments are very um, in the large minority. So it's basically the phone and cable companies that connect us to the internet, they don't want to be regulated. And so they pay some academics to come up with arguments for why there shouldn't be net neutrality. But basically everyone else, whether it's startups, small businesses, large companies, small companies, um, nonprofits, musicians, it's really, you name it, they all support net neutrality. And so I struggle giving you a good argument against net neutrality because in fairness, those don't really pass the smell test. And, you know, when the FCC eliminated net neutrality in 2017 under the Trump administration, um, they knew there was going to be a problem. And so a central part of the strategy was to not actually tell people that they were eliminating net neutrality. And so if Chairman Pai, the person who was in charge of the FCC when they eliminated net neutrality, was here, what he would tell us was that he did that to help us get more and better broadband networks. And he didn't even make the argument that net neutrality itself was somehow make creating a problem for investment in broadband. He basically argued that the legal tools that the FCC had to use to get to net neutrality, that that somehow created problems with investment incentives. And, you know, but if you look at the data, it shows that during all these times when net neutrality was in effect until basically mid-2018 when the protections ended, American ISPs have invested just as heavily um, as, as they could. So basically the data does not show a negative impact on it. Okay, so, so that's really interesting and, and I, so many questions, but I guess the one based on what you just said is, okay, since 2017, there's been a change. Are we seeing things that get you worried in terms of trends of, um, I don't know, big tech, ISPs, I don't know even who would to look for, where you're very worried about things that we're starting to see that could erode some of the principles that you articulated about the importance earlier on in the conversation? So we have absolutely started to see problems emerge. So three off the top of my head. Um, 
you might have noticed the proliferation of unlimited plans. If you go to a website, let's say Verizon, there are like 10 versions of unlimited plans and you look at them and you're like, isn't unlimited a thing? And then you start drilling down and you notice that, oh, this plan actually starts slowing down my traffic after I reach a certain amount of data if there is congestion or this cheap plan um, limits the speed for online videos. So even though I have a 5G plan, when I watch Netflix or YouTube, then it comes in much lower resolution at a slower speed just because the broadband company is using it to make more money. I see. So that's not a true technical concern. Some people might think, oh, that's because they're just trying to be fair in the allocation of resources. And maybe even they would say that. But you're saying that, no, 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 that's because it's a uh, it's a scheme for, for, for financial gain, basically. Yeah. So so, you know, technically, they are it's a neutrality violation because they are treating some kind of traffic, video traffic differently from all the other traffic. I'm getting 5G speed when I play an online game or I go to a website, but I get much lower speeds when I watch the video. So now you say, well, maybe there is a technical reason for that, which as non-technologists, you know, it's, it's a good question. The thing is, um, these kinds of restrictions apply regardless of whether there is congestion in the network or not. So it has nothing to do with managing the network. It's just that if you have a cheap plan, then it's generally always limiting the speed of video. If you have the most expensive plan, you generally get a chance to opt into getting the full speed for your video. And then the plans in the middle often have a combination of either it's always limited in speed or you can pay an extra 10 bucks to get more speed. And so that tells you it's basically a pure um, profit making machine where there is the attempt to price discriminate so that people who want to watch video at full resolution can pay more. Now, you might say like, well, who cares? You know, video is just fun and games and maybe we are not that bothered if people can't watch video at the full resolution on their cell phones. But the problem here is that there are a lot of different ways in which that does affect people. You know, think of all these doctors or med students who are sitting online looking at x-rays or kids who are watching um, a lecture online and they can't see the formulas because they are too small. And I mean, even if I'm a baseball fan and I want to watch the latest game in high resolution, if I pay for it, then it should be my choice what I do with that. So these, yeah, this is very helpful. I, but I want to let you give me the two ex, the two other examples because these these are pretty good. These are pretty good. Yeah. So um, those were the first two. So the third one is that um, there is a way of giving applications an advantage that we don't necessarily notice. And so you might have noticed when you look at some of your cell phone plans that they say, well, if you watch this particular video service, it doesn't count against your data cap. You know, on cell phone plans, a lot of people still have data caps, like two gigabyte per month, six gigabyte per month, and these have real teeth. And so by saying, AT&T used to say, well, if you watch my video services, like HBO Max was a good example, or if you are traveling and you're watching their, you know, conventional video service online, then it doesn't eat up your data. But then if you watch Netflix or YouTube, then you burn through your data and quickly you will have and, you know, used up your data volume for the month. And so as a result, then people do gravitate towards the applications that are exempted from the cap. And so that's something that Verizon does, AT&T does. Um, and that is a net neutrality problem Interestingly, um, California got a net neutrality law that took effect in 2019 and has been enforceable since March 2021. And uh, in response to that, AT&T then stopped engaging in the practice in the whole nation and Verizon stopped doing it 
just for California, because that's the scope of the net neutrality law. But that's another example where you can see how important video is. You know, we get news and and education and fun online. And and so giving broadband providers the choice to make certain kinds of applications more attractive than others. You know, if I want to watch my local church, um, the, the Sunday service online, that should not affect my data any differently than if I watch H, uh, HBO Max. So really helpful. And, and so now you've gotten, you know, everybody now is up, up uh, alerted and, and, and activated by this. Let me just step back and say, who, who kind of, and, and forgive me if this is a ridiculous question, who owns the internet? Like there are, there are fiber optics, there are wires, you mentioned wireless, but then there's also the kind of backbone folks. Are they all um, equally um, kind of involved in the uh, in these potential abuses or are, are there certain sectors that we're more worried about by others i guess I, I don't mean to ask a compound question that is unanswerable so who who are the players here and 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 um and do they make do they have ownership interests in the internet yeah so as you say you know the internet is a network of networks so whenever we use the internet there are probably several internet providers involved in that you know my internet service provider that connects me to the internet and most people who um have somewhat more money have two you know their wireline company the former cable company and then their wireless company at&t t-mobile verizon are the biggest three that sort of divide up the market for wireless services. And these consumer facing ISPs, they are the ones we are really concerned about. Then there are sort of big networks in the middle of the internet, like the highways of the internet, and they shuffle all the data between the smaller networks attached to the internet. They don't have an interest in interfering with the data that's flowing through. They just wanna get the data to its destination as quickly and efficiently as possible. And then there are often companies that specialize in serving big businesses or companies like Google and Facebook often run their own network infrastructure and they too don't really have an interest in, in messing with the data. But the problem, and that's where at least in the US, the net neutrality protections focus are the companies that sell internet access to people like you and me and then medium and small businesses that don't have the market power to protect themselves. Very good, very good. This is the future of everything with Russ Altman. More with Barbara Van Shevik next. Welcome back to the future of everything. I'm Russ Altman. I'm speaking with Professor Barbara Van Shevik about net neutrality. In the last segment, Barbara defined net neutrality for us and told us why we might want to be worried about it. In this segment, she'll tell us what's going on at the federal level in the U.S., She'll tell us why we should care about the power of large internet companies and how this interacts with net neutrality. And finally, she'll tell us how we as individuals can both try to protect our own uh, internet use and how we can participate in the conversation and policy making at the federal and state levels. So Barbara, in this segment, I just wanted to start out, what's happening federally? You made a uh, reference to some California laws which um, affected some federal situations, but not all. Um, where are we at the federal level and should the federal government get involved or not? Yeah, so as I said, the United States has had net neutrality basically nonstop until 2017. And then in 2017, under the Trump administration, the Federal Communications Commission eliminated all net neutrality protections and also gave up all oversight over broadband. And so that's been the federal situation. And so basically since 2017, uh, people have tried and fought to bring back net neutrality at the federal level. Um, net neutrality laws actually passed the Senate with bipartisan votes. Then in a different Congress, they passed the House. Unfortunately, they haven't passed both houses at the same time in the same Congress. And Democrats have long united behind net neutrality and said, when we are back in power, we will bring back net neutrality. And so you might wonder why hasn't that happened, you know, two years into the administration. And so it turns out that the FCC has five commissioners and usually three are a member of the president's party, two are Republican, so the other party. And 
the fifth commissioner has been nominated. It's a woman named Gigi Son, a longtime fighter for consumers and the public interest. And a combination of Republicans and and like heavy and often pretty unfair lobbying by the broadband providers has delayed her confirmation until now. And so basically the FCC hasn't been able to do anything because the Senate hasn't confirmed Gigi Son. So it turns out she has her new confirmation hearing on Valentine's Day next Tuesday. And so um, chances are that she will finally be confirmed. And when that happens, that's the point, uh, the time when the FCC is expected to bring back net neutrality because she has been a long time net neutrality supporter as well. But it does raise the question about whether we are just one administration away from backsliding again. So do you have confidence that even with this three to two majority for a couple of years, there'll be long lasting stability? Or is this fundamentally going to be in an unstable situation for many years to come, depending on who's in charge? Yeah, so in an ideal world, we would have a net neutrality law. And many countries around the world do have that. The problem with that is that getting a net neutrality right, law right is actually really tricky because while the principle is simple, um, there are so many ways in which you can pick winners and losers. And if the law doesn't protect against all of them, then you can basically forget about it. And so the big fight in getting a law has always been the ISP's fight for the Swiss cheese version of net neutrality that has so many loopholes that it becomes meaningless. And then try to get this kind of law through a legislature where every single legislator is prone to lobbying. It worked in California. California has a law that is um, widely viewed as the model law. But that was highly unusual, was a huge fight. So that would be the ideal situation. So without that, we are just left with the FCC doing a neutrality. And there, my, my take is it's better to be protected than not. And interestingly, in every iteration of the net neutrality fight, more and more people and policymakers as well have started to understand that net neutrality is really critical. So when the net neutrality law passed the California legislature, one third of the Republican group in the assembly voted in favor of the law. And it did pass the Senate in California with bipartisan votes as well. And so as net neutrality comes back, that doesn't just protect consumers and companies while it's in effect, it also over time just through being in effect and, you know, going back to seeing Some inertia, that, inertia. Yeah, uh, that, that hopefully it will become more stable. Great. OK. And I did want to turn you've written and talked about the role of large Internet companies in net neutrality, Google, Facebook, all of our all of our favorites. I, I hesitate to say that. Um, what do they have a role in uh, uh, in this in this discussion? Yeah, so, you know, I'm sure you are probably concerned, like many of us, about the huge power that these platforms, Google, Facebook, Twitter, have acquired over both speech that is relevant to the democracy and, you know, the market in general. And so many, that's something that really captures our imagination. And I agree that you know, there are very real problems that need to be addressed. And so does this have anything to do with net neutrality? Not directly in the following sense. Net neutrality applies to the companies that connect us to the internet. But it's actually really critical if you are worried about the power of the large platforms. And here's why. Basically, net neutrality protects the underdog, the new guy. It means that if Twitter does stuff that we disagree with, or stops working randomly on a Wednesday afternoon, then we can go to a Twitter alternative like, let's say, Mastodon, and those Mastodon data packets aren't stuck in the slow lane. So Mastodon gets to compete on an equal footing. And we have seen that over and over. So we talked about this exempting apps from data caps. In Europe for a long time, um, the broadband providers were exempting certain apps from data caps. Almost every broadband provider exempted Facebook and Twitter. And so now you can imagine if 
you use Facebook or Twitter, it doesn't count against your cap. But if you want to use the Twitter alternative or the Facebook alternative, it eats up your data. And that's a real impediment for people who are what, what, uh, worried about reaching their cap. And so basically, I always say, if you're worried about the power of the large platforms, you need to care about net neutrality, no matter what else we are doing, because that allows the next challenger to emerge. Yes. No, that makes perfect sense. And uh, uh, and it sounds like there's already been some precedent for this kind of preferential treatment. So this is not a theoretical entity. This is something that you can point to, at least in that case in Europe. Well, I wanted to spend the last couple of minutes. Um, I think you've gotten us all riled up about new, net neutrality. Congratulations. Um, what can an individual do both for their own personal protection I don't, um, in terms of protecting their uh, uh, exposure to unfair practices and also if they want to get involved in the bigger conversation at the policy level? Are there things that the, the little guy can do? Yeah. So if you want to protect yourself, then you're Possible opportunities are somewhat limited because it really depends on what your broadband provider is doing. And so there, to the extent you have a choice, and unfortunately, most Americans don't, you know, I live in the middle of Palo Alto, Silicon Valley, I have one choice in providers. But some people do have choice. And usually the smaller providers, like Sonic, or, you know, they believe in a neutrality, they run their network in a neutral way. And so you can help yourself by Bring, get it, putting your business with them. But in general, so if net neutrality is basically the story of people power winning over big business. And the phone and cable companies have been around, at least the phone companies that the beginning, since the beginning of the 19th century, they are some of the most powerful companies, both in the state legislatures and in DC. And they have fought like hell over the t past 20 years to kill net neutrality at every turn. That's not just lobbying, they fight hard, they fight dirty. When the California law was going through the legislature, they paid at least $6 million for two lobbyists and then sponsored groups to place robocalls to senior citizens that were basically scaring them that their bill would go up if there was net neutrality. or. In, at the federal level, you know, realizing that in 2015 and 2010, so many people had written to the FCC, millions of people, and said, we want net neutrality, the ISPs felt, oh, we need to do something about it. And so they paid a firm to gin up comments. And when those firms weren't able to do that, they basically filed 10 million comments with stolen identities and the names of dead people. And it so- It sounds like they're using the Russian playbook. Yeah, so it is really not, you know, sort of a fair fight. But over and over, net neutrality has been helped by people picking up their phone, calling their member of Congress or their member of the California legislature and saying, this is really important to me as a business owner, as a normal Internet user, as someone who uses the Internet for education, please help us bring back net neutrality at the federal level. And then when the FCC actually starts the process of bringing back net neutrality, there will be a public consultation. And in that, hearing from normal people has been really instrumental. And so that this is an area where sort of both in 2010 and 2015, and then in California, this combined um, power of people standing up and saying, we need this, and being creative about it has helped us overcome the huge and entrenched lobbying power of the large companies. And I do hope that we will be able to do that again at the federal level. That is fantastic. And it gives all of us something to think about, both in terms of our personal choice of ISP provider when we have choice and ways that we can actually inform our uh, governmental officials that we care about this issue. Thanks to Barbara Van Schievik. That was the future of net neutrality. You have been listening to The Future of Everything with Russ Altman. You can follow me on Twitter at RB Altman, and you can follow Stanford Engineering at Stanford E-N-G.